to the What The Show podcast. The goal of the What The Show podcast is to provide a platform for people of Kentucky and Appalachia that are in some way being influential through music, art, business, philanthropy, essentially anybody that is in some way flipping the negative narrative that Kentucky is a bunch of 
them rednecks and hillbillies. Right. And by using yeah, and we, only, we only drink LA stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, you know. and smoke weed. And uh, but by providing their talents and skills, they're using this platform to flip the negative narrative that we face. And my next guest is definitely one of those people, uh, Mr. Jeremy Short, um, into a trance, uh, correct? That's right. That's it. Yeah, I that's. That, yeah. I think that's where we're where we all just were after you just played yeah. that music that you played for us. So, Thank you. kind of, um, you're from Jackson, Kentucky, correct? Right. Yeah. So, being a, a guy from Breathitt County, Kentucky, what was some of the major musical influences of your life? We've we've had this conversation before, but. It was in a live setting. We did the uh, flood relief event at the Paramount, yeah, yeah. and you also helped me with uh, <coughs> the event we did at Thatcher's. But this one's recorded; uh, won't be a live broadcast. So, uh, kind of walk us through that. Well, I would have to say that the first, probably the first music I ever heard was probably in church. My grandfather was a pastor at Wolverine United Methodist in Breathitt County, and uh, my grandmother played piano played the hymns and we were playing along. So I said I would say the first music I heard was that was her playing the piano. And my mother listening to tapes in the car, listening to the radio and stuff like that. So I was born in nineteen eighty seven, so we're talking late eighties, radio hits, stuff like that. Uh, my mom had a great collection of forty fives. And those of you out there not familiar, if you're not into vinyl collecting the forty fives are the singles that would come with side A, side B. And she had a big, just a little, little box of singles from the late 70s till about just right after the time I was born of, of AM Radio Gold, you know, we'll call it, which, which is a dead format, AM Radio <laughs> these days, but uh, that's what they listen to. My favorite to. radio shows on AM Radio. Hey, Coast to Coast AM, <laughs> that's a good one. And it's only on AM Radio. But, um, so then my uncle played piano as well, so I was listening to him play piano around the house, and my great-grandmother played piano as well, and she had this super unique, really cool, almost, I want to say ragtime style, maybe you might call it, might be the genre to be defined as, but it, she learned to play from playing along to an old player piano. So it sounded, she sounded like an old western saloon, if you like an old black, picture an old black and white movie guy walking into the saloon in the old west, and the guy's playing the piano, that's what my great-grandma sounded like. Uh, and I do not much uh, in the in, in when I'm playing with the band. I don't have to fill up as much space. But when I'm playing by myself, I kind of take from little bits and pieces of the way she used to play, where she would had a very strong left hand going with a bass line, and then she would play melodies on top of that that were very sophisticated and sound like more than two people playing, really a lot of the time. But I try to cop some of that into some of the, what you call Travis picking. If you get into playing guitar and go down that rabbit hole. That's a finger picking style. And, that, and that's what the Paul McCartney wrote, he used to wrote to a blackbird, but it's a style that uh, Chet Atkins really, really made popular. But it's named after a guy named Merle Travis from, from, uh, from the western part of the state, western Kentucky. And he just had this style that was just your thumb really driving it, and then you're playing melodies on top with your finger. To that specific extent, but she was she was a great musician, and uh, I wish there was some recording that I had her to kind of help explain the way she sounded. But it definitely had an impact on what I was doing. It's recording your brain. Yeah, well, it's it's, it's major. It's obviously made a huge influence. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to put this out there somewhere. At, at Breath of County, she came to Breath of County High School one day. I can't even remember why she was staying with us at the time, but she was. She came to the high school one day and just played for all of us in the band room at the end of the day. And it was a wild experience for everybody because they'd never heard this 89-year-old woman just sit down and tell stories and play piano like she did. She was a one-of-a-kind personality, but somebody filmed it. I remember there being film of it. So Shorty Combs, if you're out there, if you're listening, if somebody could get this to Shorty Combs, he still works there at Bradley High. I believe he might uh, have access to some old footage of her playing, but I need to track him down and find that out because I would love to get that out to the world. 
for sure. So that was some of my earliest musical influences. After that, I'm just listening to the radio a lot, and I love. And, I, and when I was a little kid, it was top 40 radio stuff like that. Now we're in the early 90s, right? For so like Michael Jackson, <laughs> MC Hammer, <laughs> and Vanilla Ice, and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I really didn't start paying attention to what to play until I was, I don't know, 10 or 11. I started hearing ACDC and stuff like that. I remember SummerSlam 1997. <laughs> the theme. The theme was. <laughs> I thought that was the coolest thing ever. I'm like, I'm on. I'm like 10 years old, you know, singing along. Yeah, you sugar cookie. And I fell in love with it, you know, as a kid does when you're that young and you hear it for the first time. I fell in love with ACDC. Summer Slam, so you bought that on pay per view for sure. Oh, I don't, I don't think I did. I remember, oh. I remember watching it with friends. So. Hey, are you lying? Did you have one of those cards? No. Do you know about those cards? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. I don't know about that. I'm just joking. I have no idea what yeah. I'm talking about. I'm sure Jim doesn't know about that either. Yeah. It, uh, uh, Dan, Danny's father was a cable cable office worker for a long time, worked for the cable company. He knows so, about it now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But uh, yeah, well, I ordered the pay-per-view once, so WrestleMania, but it was online. It was on like a modem during the dial-up era. Oh, God. Like dial-up era WrestleMania. <laughs> I, remember, I remember seeing Devon Dudley go through a table, and, like, and I could barely tell it was Devon Dudley. It like you repeated know. like eight times, yeah. and you're like, man, these, this is a great replay. And you're like, no, nah, unfortunately, that's just a connection. Is that 30-day trial stacks on the internet? Yes. Yes. <laughs> AOL 30 days. Yeah. You get you get internet for 30 days with this AOL CD. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's like Columbia House. You never oh have to pay God. in. Just CDs for a penny. Dude, yes. Yeah, I pay in time. There are some cool subscription services that aren't necessarily like that that someone could probably resurrect that. Well, yeah. Well, Columbia House is probably the first CDs I ever got for myself that, yeah. were, that I intended to get for myself. Yeah. That somebody didn't buy for me. Yeah. And yeah, I remember getting the BV King CD, and that was really, really probably when it was about fourth grade. And that's when I started really honing in on all that sound. Did you can hear it. it? Yeah, all, all the, yeah, uh, I memorized the first solo from the, that BV King CD. It was a, it's a CD called Blue Summit. It's like a album of duets with him and a bunch of classic legendary blues people. But the, the first solo. And I'll always remember it. It just kicks into a song called Play It With My Friend, and then it kicks off with him. And I loved his touch, and I loved his tone and his phrasing, and, uh, and I just started buying everything B.B. King from there. And around that same time, Eric Clapton had a single uh, from the movie Phenomenal, which starring John Travolta. Of, uh, Changed the world, and I had that single as well. So it was Eric Clapton, BB King. And I started noticing all this stuff and just hearing it and wanting to play it. Eventually, when I was 14 years old, I, my mom bought me a guitar, and I started. I just stayed in my room and played guitar a lot. Did you ever have that all hall moment just when you're like, I'm going to be a musician, or like, did it kind of just generally come along or? Well, it just kind of had, it didn't occur to me that it was something that you could do and take seriously when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just playing gigs, this is cool. And I'm like 15 years old. For playing, fun. Playing at the Mexican restaurant in Hazard. Yeah. Just for fun. And uh, getting blackout drunk <laughs> when I was 15 years old. Probably shouldn't tell that story, but, but I remember the singer of the band, I was real nervous. I was 15, I hadn't played a lot of gigs. It was back when, um, it still sold 151, Bacardi 151. Okay. He got me a shot of 151 between every set. And it was like a three set night or something like that. So by the end of the night, I'm just, I can't even stand up, you know. Three shots of Bacardi 151. Yeah. Twist, twist up. Yeah, but so, <laughs> but so yeah, some of my gig first experiences playing gigs are just clubs around here, bars around here. Places in Hazard, Kentucky that aren't around anymore, so like the Hillbilly Palace. Which used to be up on a hill if you're living hazard. I don't know the area, what the neighborhood you call it well enough, but just the hill above Taco Bell there. 
I think it's a church now or something like that. It's been a bingo hall. It's been several different things. <laughs> but it used to be the Hillbilly Palace, and I played a lot of gigs there. I used to play at the Riverboat at the Fugits uh, Entertainment Center. With the movie, there was a movie theater. There was a water park, yeah, a skate park, and a bowling alley. And the, and the water park had this big old riverboat in it and had a little bar in it. That's one of the gigs you played in the area. It was just set up for two, a month there or whatever. You go to the next place and play your, play your Gary Stewart there type of thing, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it just, I had fun doing it and I didn't really start taking it seriously until I was about uh, 21, 22 years old and just wanted to started playing original music with people and I started playing with Sasha Colette and the Magnolias. Probably when I was 22, 23 I want to say, around 2010, 2011-ish. And uh, so yeah, and then from there I just started playing with other people and started writing songs myself and wanted to do the thing for myself. Be a creative person and get those songs out of my head and play for people. Well dude, I, I love what you're doing. I've been pretty generally accepted that what you're doing is pretty incredible music. So, want to play another song for us? Yeah, absolutely, sure. What's the name of it? I don't know what I'm going to play right now. I didn't think that far ahead. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. No, we're all professionals here. I might as well do probably a song called Rock of Ages. It's about growing up in a small town and there not being a whole lot to do there. Thank you. 
Thank you all. So I am always like super fascinated to find out like how some, like when someone's writing a song, how they kind of like do their process and the influence of like what's in their mind when they're writing or like if there's like a peak sensation when you're sure. like, oh, this is when I'm supposed to be writing. So like when, you, is there like a, well, yeah. do you have I like did, a ritual? Or I like feel a, those moments. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's a half and half, it's a six one way, half a dozen the other situation where you got to make yourself do it, really. If you're taking yourself seriously, you've set aside time to, to hone this, this craft. And it's one of those things where, you know, you're doing it just to be doing it a lot of the time. You're going to write songs that nobody's ever going to hear. You're going to write songs that you're like, well, that's garbage, but at least I got it out of my system and I can move on to the next thing. Or you'll be sitting around and you'll watch TV, whatever you're watching, and you'll feel a thing or listen to music. Whatever, whatever, watching the dishes, taking out the trash, whatever you're doing, and you'll have a thought and it'll enter your mind and you'll say, well, now's the time to grab a pen and paper or pick up a guitar and play this, play the chord progression I'm hearing or play, uh, or write down the lyrics that you're, that you're singing in your head. So yeah, it comes and it goes and it goes both ways. you really got to set aside time and cut off the rest of the world and just make yourself do the thing day in, day out. But it does get, you get those moments too where it's going to happen no matter what you're doing. So, you have a pretty incredible summer coming up, I would say. Um, you've had some pretty big leaps and bounds you've taken over the last year, especially since we did the show after the flood relief event. And it's um, it's been really cool to see, you know, you've, you've released your, your newest album, and it's, it's like... Uh, we, we've talked many times about how interesting it is. We I, I used to work with you at B-Dubs. Yeah. It's just like, you and I worked at this place that's like, you would not look at people <laughs> that are doing some interesting and, and cool things like we are and be like, those dudes worked at B-Dubs. I know. Well, you would be I like, mean, they're, and, my, and that's nothing on people who work at B-Dubs, but it's like, the creative in us was probably being tortured. <laughs> You would probably say working a job like that, wouldn't oh, you? Oh, it was, and it had. Well, B Dubs was <laughs> was was a little different because the management there they were very flexible. They were, yes. Letting me play music and getting, I would call the day of a show. One time I called the day we were uh, Sasha Cole that was opening for Sunday Best. And I called him and Noel and I was like, I'm not gonna be there. I'm opening for Sunday Best. <laughs> you know, okay. I can't remember what shift I was working. Back then, that was like, killing it, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was like 2013-ish era. Yeah. Who was killing it more, B Dubs or Buffalo Wild Wings and Moorhead? <laughs> Seriously though, no. man. I mean, <laughs> slinging wings. They, they, we got pretty slammed a couple times. <laughs> a couple for sure. times. Uh, but no, I, I, I didn't, you know, but when I was working elsewhere and not playing music, that's really what it was, but when I would get bothered and be like, well, I should get that itch and you got to go out there and do it, you know, or is he just going to go a little crazy and go stir crazy and it's just, you're not going to feel complete or like you're doing what you need to be doing. But yeah, uh, I think you mentioned some shows and playing out, out elsewhere. Uh, if you want to go look at jeremyshortmusic.com. We update that. We update the tour schedule fairly regular on that website. And we also keep you updated fairly regular on the, on the Facebook and Instagram pages. So, yeah, look out for us there. If you got a zip code, we'll try to be there. Um, what are some big shows that come to mind that you're going to be playing on? I know you're going to be playing a few festivals this so upcoming year. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I was going to say you're on yeah, Fallsburg, right? right? Fallsburg's coming up, and that's always real cool. Are you going to be playing Healing Appalachia? Uh, I'll probably try to be there. They haven't announced that yet, I guess. Yeah, they so. don't announce that lineup yet. They haven't announced it yet, so I don't know about that. I would, I mean, I don't know anything, but I would imagine <laughs> that I would I would probably expect to see you there, but I hope so, at least. I mean, hopefully one day. Hopefully one day, for sure. Have you been to Lewisburg before? I, yeah, I've been there. I was there. I saw you there last okay, time. Okay, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry, that's silly. I've, been to, I've played in Lewisburg several times. That's a great place, yeah. man. Yeah, it really is. Uh, 
I played at that pizza place they have there. I can't remember what the name of it is. Rosin or uh, Holler. Hill and Holler. Hill and Holler. Hill and Holler. Yeah, Holler. That's Holler. Holler. I played in there one time. There's nobody, nobody in there, but we did it. It was fun. Dude, that place is, uh, it's like, I think that's what Moorhead could be. You know, would like really focus and be like, I mean, it's not ever going to be as ritzy as like Lewisburg. Yeah, for sure. Because there's like the Greenbrier. Yeah, I like the town next to it, Ronsford. Yeah. It looks like it's pronounced Ronsiberte. Yeah. But it's Ronsford. I think that's like, uh, my, that's how my mamma would, my, my great, my family's from around that area. Yeah, He'd nice. say Ronsford. Nice. That's how they say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's a really French word, but. It's like one of the oldest cities in America or something, isn't it? That's incredible. I want to say that like there's a sign. That I know it was like, voted. It was voted coolest small town in America some year. All those, all those towns yeah. are Lewisburg, cool. Ronsburg. <laughs> uh, have you been Fayetteville? Fayetteville. Yeah, that's a cool area too. <laughs> well, that's where uh, like playing around there. Charlie's from there, right? Yeah, Charlie's from Lewisburg. Well, he lives in Lewisburg. I don't know where. He's I think from, he's from Fayetteville, Fayetteville, but he lives in Lewisburg. Very cool. I'm mistaken. Very cool. Because there's a guy. Have you ever played at Secret Sandwich Society? Yes. Lewis Reinhardt. Lewis Reinhardt and I have been talking about doing a podcast because they're about to reopen Secret Sandwich Society. And I love that place. So. I love that place. Yeah, I can't wait for them to reopen there. Yeah. Well, um, I want to get a Kennedy as soon as they do. <laughs> Dude, those sandwiches yeah. there are incredible, aren't they? Yeah, they're incredible. Incredible. The one with fried eggplant was really good, too. Well, it's just the. the the New River Gorge area has been very like. Yeah. Well, they got some incredible food in that place. Yeah. It's like a little stretch of West Virginia where we could travel anywhere and just like not go wrong yeah. eating at any restaurant. Or just about. the beer or cocktails. Yeah, exactly. Have you exactly. been right. to the General Lewis Inn? No, I have not. It's, no. it's in Lewisburg. It's, it's, it's like it was General Lewis. One of the guys that's like an old like Civil War town. And sure. That was like his quarters, and they've yeah. converted it into like this old hotel, and it's like haunted as fuck. Indeed, that's very cool. <laughs> it's haunted as fuck. I thought it was gonna be like it's cool as shit. It's yeah. so cool. Yeah. It is. It's, it's really cool. Like hard Incredibly haunted. <laughs> but they have uh, they have a a really cool cocktail bar there where all the herbs and all the botanicals and stuff. They get from the garden that's behind. That's super awesome. I love something like that. Yeah, I love that. So yeah. if, if next time y'all are there, go check that place out. It's like a bed and breakfast. Indeed. Uh, oh, hell yeah. Dude, I'll, I'll, my goal is to honestly move to Lewisburg one day. That's a good goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's like a little bit of, of a redneck Riviera. Solid, yeah. That's a good, that's a good place to be. You ever Would been be? to the burrito bar up Dude, around there? Dude, Thunderbird Burrito. Thunderbird Burrito and, uh, or Thunderbird Taco. Thunderbird Taco and then the Wild Bean. The wild Bean. Coffee. Okay, great, yeah. Well, dude, uh, it's been great chatting with you. I always like to close out and kind of ask what the impact is that someone's looking to make with what they're doing. So what would you leave words with for people that are an up-and-coming musician or artist, and, and what would words be for you or for them from the perspective of like what you would say is like, hey, this is the impact I'm trying to make. Here's some, here's some things you could use as like a guiding light or a northern light for when times get tough or when times are good. Just some advice for someone up For coming. sure. Uh, I would tell people to just be themselves more than anything and just play, play and write the music that's in your heart that's gonna come out if you let it and just uh, don't force it any more than you have to. But don't try to be something that you're not or try to please somebody or make somebody else happy or do something because you think people are going to react to it in a positive way or anything like that. And try to very selfishly make yourself happy first and foremost. And if it sounds good to you and it turns you on and gets your mojo working, then it's really then it's, it's tr easily translatable for other people to feel the same way and for you to project that feeling and get that feeling across to the rest of the world. Well, dude, I think you're doing a great, yeah, yeah. You're doing a great job of, of sending those vibes, and I think you've been uniquely yourself since I've known you, and I think that's an absolutely beautiful thing. It's shown in your music, 
it's shown in the interactions that you do with people, and I hope you keep it up. Thank you. Yeah, Thank man. you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, what's this song going to be called? Uh, we're just going to do the title track to the album we got out. Happy right. Trees. Right. Um, so, if you're listening to the What the Shut podcast or you're watching it, we really appreciate you all. We're going to be doing a, an Earth Day event. You're obviously not going to know about this, but I just want to give a huge shout out to Gray Line Station and the people here at uh, West over at Old North Bar. Um, I've been really blessed to be able to do some really cool stuff here. We just did Strings in the Spring this past weekend, and that would not be possible without the people here. And then also, like I said, we're doing an event with Vintage Therapy this upcoming weekend. And it's been quite a blessing to be able to promote the art of Appalachia and the, the, the stuff that is so uniquely um, Kentucky or absolutely Appalachian, whatever you want to say. But this stuff wouldn't be possible without you coming and um, people like Dylan playing and places like this to do this stuff out. So thank you all so much and happy trees from Mr. Jeremy Short. Thank you. Thank you, Shuck. All right. We'll start this one off a little differently than what I usually do. I'm just going to play around a little bit. Thank you. 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you, dude. You got me well.